pleased and impressed by the number of people who have turned out to hear about Crazy Horse um, and glad to see so many. Crazy Horse was an Oglala Sioux chief, uh, a charismatic figure who made a deep impression on his people and uh, for military action as a tactical leader in, in back cavalry tactics. Um, and he was one of a large number of American Indians who have been killed in the course of the dispossession of Native Americans from, from the land that we all live on. And everybody knows this. This is something we've all grown up with, that uh, we live in a place where other people used to live and that we basically took it away. And it happened so often to so many different peoples that spoke so many languages that it's kind of hard to keep straight. Um, in each case, it was roughly the same. But in the case of the Sioux peoples who lived on the northern plains uh, and were dispossessed or conquered, as it was called at the time, in the 1860s and 70s, um, we have an opportunity to to know what happened, to pay attention in a detailed way to know what happened. Uh, in many other cases, uh, the details of history are, have been lost and uh, the stories are no longer possible to tell. But in this particular case, um, we know quite a lot about it. And there are a lot of reasons why we know a lot about it. One was that we were beginning to have an educated uh, military and uh, the populace at large pretty much were all readers and writers. And very shortly after this period uh, of the dispossession of the Sioux in the Northern Plains, the um, Plains Indian Wars came to a complete end. And uh, the level of hostility uh, began to drop away. And people were more prepared to sort of think about the other side in this struggle. And pretty soon they began to set down their reminiscences and to tell the stories and talk to newspaper reporters and sometimes to write books. And so we have a, we have a rich record. And uh, anybody who's been in the Army will know that they also keep voluminous records. That was the case in the, in the, of the Frontier Army in the Northern Plains as well. So there's a rich uh, uh, record there. And then um, the reservation period uh, kept very full and complete records of the Indians who lived in those reservations. So there's, there's a lot of material. There's a lot of material. And um, I got interested in this question as to why and how this particular man was killed uh, while I was out visiting the Little Bighorn Battlefield in 1994 with a, my brother. And uh, when you go to that field, which is where uh, the Lakota and their Cheyenne allies destroyed General George Armstrong Custer. Uh, one of the places you're almost certainly going to end up standing is the spot in June 1876 where Custer's body was found with about 40 of his men. Uh, something over 200 died with him that day. But uh, this particular group on the, on the hill known as Last Stand Hill uh, is just below the brow of the hill. They were going towards the brow of the hill. They hoped to make a stand on the brow of the hill, but they didn't get there. And when you stand there and you look out over the, over the valley, uh, you can see the, an immense stretch of land. And you can also see, in a curious way, you can see the battle. Because when uh, other soldiers came and found the dead on the field, they marked the spot where every body was found. And later, uh, white marble stones were placed on all those spots. And when you stand on that hill and look back uh, at the long uphill approach taken by Custer's men, you can see these groups of stones uh, as they, tried, they fought their way uh, to the hill, but not quite to the top. And then over on the right, going down towards the river, there are scattered stones of the people who managed to run and, and flee for a short, short period of time and head down towards towards the river. So it's a very dramatic thing to sort of see. And um, I got interested in what was going on there. And I, I picked up a book called 
the killing of Tree Crazy Horse. And it was three eyewitness accounts. And the eyewitness accounts uh, were from Valentine McGillicuddy, who was the doctor who attended Crazy Horse on the night that he was killed, about a year after this battle at the Little Bighorn. And uh, an account of He Dog, who was a great friend, a lifelong friend of Crazy Horse, until one brief period towards the end of Crazy Horse's life when they, they parted company. And Billy Garnett, who was a mixed blood interpreter and uh, who was deeply involved in all the events that led to the killing of Crazy Horse. And uh, when, I, when I read this account of Billy Garnett's, he described a night in September of 1877, about a year after uh, the Battle of the Little Bighorn, when General George Crook and several officers and 13 Oglala Sioux chiefs met in a uh, room of an officer at uh, Fort Robinson in Nebraska to plan the murder of Crazy Horse that night. They were going to plan it, they were going to do it. As it turned out, in the end, things, things happened differently. But Garnett described this event, this moment. And um, I was a person curiously prepared to read that particular document because I had, on several occasions, done a lot of intense work about other episodes in American history that involved the assassination of foreign leaders. In particular, Fidel Castro was the one that I had looked into the most deeply, and uh, which was something organized but not carried out, as we know, by, by the CIA. And uh, I knew that there are no documents anywhere describing high officials talking about the assassination of foreign leaders. You can put it together from uh, oral testimony and ancillary sources, but nobody writes that stuff down. And uh, here was Billy Garnett just simply describing what Crook said and what Lieutenant Clark said and what the chief said. And I realized it was a, a unique document in American history. I got interested and I thought, whoa, there's got to be a lot more of that story than, than is right here. So, so I began to pay pay attention. And I decided I wanted to write a, a book about, about that event. And uh, I spent a lot of, lot of time doing it, a uh, time which I loved, I must say, because uh, it was so interesting. And it involved a lot of traveling out in the Great West. Uh, I had a nephew who lived in Colorado. I left a car at his house. Uh, I live in South Royalton. I would uh, go down to Boston and take the Southwest and fly out to Denver, which didn't cost very much, and I would go to his house and pick up this car, and then I would just wander around the West, and I would go to all these libraries and all these um, archives and, and uh, uh, local historical societies. I mean, one of the ones I liked the best was the Sheridan County Historical Society in Rushville, Nebraska, which is open about three days a year. <laughs> and, um, I was there one of those days, and, and I, I, I made friends with those people, and I got in there, and there was just a lot of really interesting stuff in there. So I spent a long, a long time doing that, and uh, I built something I learned how to do in doing research on the CIA. I built a, a very voluminous chronology of the events uh, leading up to the killing of Crazy Horse, and uh, I... Um, found all these various sources so I could, I could kind of fill in, fill in the details and take something that was largely lost, largely forgotten, and paid little attention to, and, and I, I hoped bring it back to some kind of life so that people could, could see it. Now, I, I want to talk tonight uh, a bit about who Crazy Horse was. Uh, one of, the, one of the things that's fascinating about um, the Plains Indian Wars and American relations with uh, Native Americans in general uh, is how intense and deep the differences between these various peoples uh, can be. And for the most part, uh, Anglo-Americans don't really have much knowledge of, of uh, 
Indian character and, and culture, and that's, that's certainly the case with, with the Lakota. And uh, very rarely do they, they get a deep sense of any particular individual. There are a handful of names that people know, Sitting Bull, Geronimo, Crazy Horse, a very few others. And uh, the number of people who know those names is, is dwindling, dwindling all the time. Um, but Crazy Horse himself was a, a very unusual person uh, in a lot of ways. And the first time I ever thought about Crazy Horse was when I saw an old Errol Flynn movie um, called They Died With Their Boots On. And I am sure many people in this audience have seen that movie. Uh, guys who are frontier military historians seem to have been weaned on it. It's unbelievable how many people have, remember seeing that when they were six years old or seven years old and, and got interested and never, never lost that interest. That's about the Little Bighorn. And uh, Errol Flynn plays the part of Custer and uh, he's a very stirring Custer. Uh, and the film itself has got some great stuff in it. Everything in the film bears some relation to history. But it is, you have to be deeply schooled to know <laughs> what the relationship is. And um, Crazy Horse appears in a very early episode, played by Anthony Quinn. And uh, a young, very young Anthony Quinn, and the young Anthony Quinn uh, is wearing a many feathered war bonnet of the classic sort that the Plains Indians wore, and that Crazy Horse himself never wore, because he was instructed uh, in a dream and a vision not to uh, dress himself in that particular, that particular manner. Crazy Horse was born about 1840, near Bear Butte which is just north of Sturgis, Wyoming, where they have a gigantic motorcycle rally every year. And uh, if you go to Bear Butte, uh, you can climb up to the top of it along a, a path that's been there for several hundred years. And uh, Cheyenne and Lakota Indians do this very often still today. And they go up to the top and they pray up there and they leave uh, tobacco offerings attached to trees. And uh, the presence of, uh, of the Native American sensibility is very evident and very, very real, very close to you. Um, Crazy Horse's mother was a Minicon Jew, and uh, her name was Rattle Blanket Woman. And um, I can't tell you how she got that name. Uh, sometimes uh, the names of, of Lakota Indians are self-explanatory. Sometimes they're slightly, they're easy to be understood if you, if you know how the, how the language works. Man afraid of his horses. Man afraid of his horses uh, has a name that means he has horses so fearsome that people are afraid of them, not that he's afraid of them. And uh, Rattle Blanket Woman uh, suffered a, a crisis of the heart and she committed suicide. Uh, when Crazy Horse is about four years old. Um, it's not uncommon. It's not uncommon now on the Sioux Reservations, and it was not uncommon then. When you really start reading the, the, the literature, you, you run across uh, episodes of this kind quite often. He was unusual in his physical appearance. He was light in complexion, uh, not dark, bronzed, deep, reddish color at all very light in his complexion, and his hair also was lighter than the average, a kind of a brown color instead of the, the usual black. He was s slight, uh, and he was below the middle height, around five feet, five inches tall. Uh, wiry and muscular, but not big. And very often the Sioux are big. Um, I mean, if you go to, into the Pine Ridge Reservation and you go to the Sioux Nation uh, grocery store, you will see some of these guys there, they're huge, they're 6'2", 6 6'3", 6 and they're, they're strong, and they're just big people, not, not crazy horse. He was smaller. He was very sparing in speech. 
uh, deeply laconic, rarely talked uh, in council, rarely spoke at length. Uh, the Sioux were great lovers of oratory, and uh, they were good speakers, and many of them were surpassingly eloquent men. Uh, Red Cloud, who was uh, a chief at the same time as Crazy Horse, was a man who always be counted on to come forward with a kind of a dramatic way of describing something. He met uh, Ulysses Grant in, in Washington once, and he said that the Indians were like the snow on the hillside being melted by the spring, and the whites were like the spring grass growing up in ever greater numbers, and his people were going to be overwhelmed and lost. I mean, he would say things like that uh, in, a, in a public meeting at the drop of a hat, but Crazy Horse never said anything like that. And when he was meeting in council with people, he, as a, as a chief, he often did. He had a friend very often speak for him. One of the things that I became the most interested in as I was working on this book was the whole question of Lakota religion. And it's a, uh, a very deep and subtle and complicated uh, thing. Um, I wasn't sure exactly what I expected in the beginning but it wasn't what I found, which was a very fluid kind of notion of an interconnected world that sounds more like quantum mechanics than it does like the Greek gods on Olympus. Uh, they have personalities in the, in the world of the gods, but it's mostly uh, power and connectiveness. Everything in the Lakota world uh, has power and can intervene in human affairs. It can be on your side or against you. And so <coughs> there was a constant effort to maintain a relationship with the powers of the universe and uh, to implore them to have pity on you and to be friendly to your hopes and your aspirations and, and uh, hostile to your enemies. And that ranged from, from everything, from the the trees of the forest and the, and the stones on the ground. Um, the way you made contact with such people was sometimes through an intermediary, which we often called a medicine man, who was a, like a priest in effect, a specialist in making contact with the powers of the universe, but also in dreams and in visions. And everyone's heard about the hamblichea, the crying for a vision, four-day ceremony in the wilderness where a man goes out, eats nothing, drinks nothing, prays, and waits for a vision. And the vision is going to be something connected to the world that tells him how to live his life. And uh, Crazy Horse had such a vision. Um, and in his vision, he described a man on a horse who rode up out of a lake. And uh, that lake is not named and its location is never identified. Uh, but in the whole of the northern plains, there's basically only one lake in the area where Crazy Horse would likely have been in. That's Lake DeSmet. So we, and that's an area that was right at the center of the Oglala homeland. And uh, very likely that is where uh, this man in the lake rode up out of the water. And he told Crazy Horse a number of things. Um, he told him that he must not tie up his horse's tail. And it was the custom of the Sioux to tie up their horse's tail with otter fur and ribbons and, and other decorations when they were going to war. But this man on the horse told him, no, don't do that. Your horse needs his tail to uh, help him when he's jumping and running. That was, that was what he told him. So Crazy Horse did not tie up his horse's tail, unlike all the rest of the Sioux. And he told him, no boar bonnets. Uh, Crazy Horse never wore more than one or two uh, tail feathers from an eagle in his hair. And he typically wore them running down. Not running up, but running down. Uh, Unusual, again, among the, the Sioux people. That's not the way they typically did it, but that's the way he did it. And uh, he was also instructed to uh, place a few strands of slow grass in his hair. It's a kind of a thick-bladed grass that grows in marshy places 
go on the, the planes. It's aromatic, and uh, he always had a couple of strands of this grass stuck in his hair. And once I really started to get into reading about Crazy Horse and getting into all the various sources that there are, of which I say there are a great many, I found a number of people mentioning this, this trait of his, always a few strands of grass in his hair. He had a friend named Hornchips, and, uh, who was a, a medicine man and who uh, gave him a lot of instruction about uh, how to make himself strong in war. And he prepared for him certain amulets with uh, special stones. And uh, these, these special stones were sometimes chosen for their color or their shape. They might remind a person of a physical part of the body or of a creature. Uh, but one way or another, they were thought to have power. And Crazy Horse had two of them. And uh, one of them was on a, uh, had a hole through it. It was strung on a thong that he carried under his left arm. And another one uh, was tucked into his hair behind his left ear. And he almost always had these about his person. Around his neck, he carried what's called a wotawe. And uh, a wotawe is like a little leather bag. This is that type of a thing, but this is not one. This is my eyeglass case. But the wotawe was a little leather bag, and it would have stuff in it. And uh, it was personal to each, each man, and it brought power. Uh, Crazy Horse carried there the uh, wild aster, uh, and also the uh, dried, crushed brain of an eagle, and several other things. This comes from uh, the son of a friend of his. And there are several other reports of things that he, he carried in his, his Wiltawe. He was a warrior before he was anything else. And it's hard to imagine just how much war uh, the life of a Plains Indian could involve. It's really extreme. You can hardly believe it at times, just how often they went to war and how much danger they actually uh, confronted. And they did everything in their power to uh, invite the intervention of the gods in their behalf to prevent themselves from being killed or wounded in war. But they, they went anyway. And uh, of course, they all understood that uh, men died in war or were badly injured in war, sometimes never fully recovered. And so they had a kind of a culture that uh, was built around the notion of looking to die. Uh, a, a Lakota warrior was somebody who thought of himself as accepting and embracing the probable fate of any warrior over time. The battle that took place at the Little Bighorn in June of 1876 was a major uh, military collision of, of two peoples. It lasted uh, a couple of hours, and when all the phases of it were added together, and uh, 200 and 50 soldiers altogether were killed, and about 30 or 35 Indians were killed. And they, the vast majority of them were all killed kind of personally. I mean, just right in a hand-to-hand -hand situation. It was not long distance shooting. It was right up close. People were clubbed to death. They were stabbed to death. They were shot at point blank range. It was an extremely violent encounter. And uh, you would imagine that anybody who'd been through such a thing would just have had enough of that for quite a long time. But um, Crazy Horse, within a week or 10 days, went off with some, some of his friends north to the steal horses from the Assiniboine. And when they got back from that raid, they spent a few days in camp. And then they, another group of about 10 headed south and west towards the Black Hills to steal horses from the white miners who were mining for gold in the Black Hills. And there were two or three other similar uh, raiding parties that he took part in that summer. That summer. And the week before the Battle of the Little Bighorn, Crazy Horse had been the leader of the Indians in a second separate fight at the Rosebud River in which uh, General George Crook and a thousand men were sort of fought to a standstill. 
and persuaded to leave the country, in effect. So the, the level of actual combat that was going on, of actual fighting that was going on in these lives was something, something really kind of, kind of amazing. And Crazy Horse, as I said, would always prepare himself. And um, a man named Spider once described, no, this is Eagle Elk, a description by Eagle Elk, who, who described what Crazy Horse did before he went into battle. And uh, I found this just so interesting, I thought I would read this one brief section to you about what he did before going to war. He always wore a strand of braided buckskin. At the lower end was something like medicine tied up in the buckskin. He had an eagle wing whistle tied on. He had it on with him all the time. Just before the start of a battle, when they were ready to go into it, he got off his pony and got a little dirt from a molehill and put it between the ears of his horse and then on the hips of the horse. And then he took some and got in front of the horse and threw it over toward the tail. And then he got around behind the horse and threw some toward his head. Then he rubbed a little on his hand and over his own head. Then he took a spotted eagle feather and put it upside down on the back of his head instead of standing up, as most did. Chips was the one who directed Crazy Horse to do these things so he would not be hurt. The question of the killing of Crazy Horse comes down, in my mind, to two matters. Two things you need to understand in order to begin to have a sense of, of what it meant and, and why it happened. The first one is, why did the army want to kill him? And the second one is, why did he let them do it? Now I should tell you a little bit about this actual killing so you understand what kind of an event it was. It happened on the 5th of September, 1877. And the army, Crazy Horse had surrendered with all of his people in May of 1877 and was living on an agency, which is what they called reservations at the time, in northwest Nebraska, the Red Cloud Agency. So he'd spent four months that summer there and during that time, by almost imperceptible degrees, and for reasons you could never quite put your finger on, bad blood rose among the whites about Crazy Horse, a deepening suspicion, a, a, a um, sense that he was dangerously resistant and that he was not going to remain a peaceable person, although he had promised peace eternally. When he, when he surrendered, he insisted that he sit on the ground when they talked, because the ground was solid and this peace would be solid too. And he insisted they shake hands with their left hands because the left hand was closer to the heart. And he said he was not going to fight anymore. And over the course of the summer, the, the soldiers quit believing that and became suspicious of him. And there were a lot of reasons why they were suspicious. Um, it was finally decided uh, in early September to place him under arrest and to ship him to a prison in Florida, just to get him out of the territory. And uh, it was at that time when Crook decided, first of all, to murder him at night, and then uh, for various reasons, uh, that plan was dropped and a separate plan was made the next day to arrest him. And uh, troops were sent out to, to place him under arrest. Uh, but of course, he was deeply connected with all the Indians living all around the fort, and he was warned in good time. And with his wife and two friends, he mounted up and rode off 40 miles to the east to a second agency, where his uncle Spotted Tail was the, the leading chief. And the soldiers chased him down there and, and persuaded him to come back to Fort Robinson to talk to the commander. Uh, and then, despite numerous promises that he would not be touched or harmed or imprisoned or ill-treated in any way, uh, an attempt was made to place him in, uh, in the guardhouse. And that's when he attempted to break free. And there was a scuffle, and he was stabbed in the back, and he died. That's how he was killed. It was a series of cascading events, that one thing leading to another, much misunderstanding, ill will in, in secret ways, intrigue, pushing things forward. It was a very complex uh, event that ended up with this single man killed. Nobody else was killed that day. 
So why did they want to kill him? Why did they, I mean, why did they really want to kill him? If you look at the history of this particular event, there are a lot of little reasons why they thought, you know, he couldn't be trusted or he was not really for him and he didn't want to become a scout for Crook and this, that, and the other. But the real reason was much deeper. And the real reason was it was Crazy Horse who had killed George Armstrong Custer. And uh, that was a bitter blow and a humiliating defeat for the United States Army. And he did it himself, personally, uh, in the following way. Custer's men, still in fairly good order, were fleeing up the backbone of a long extended hill towards the last end hill where his body was eventually found and strung out along this backbone when Crazy Horse led a charge from the far side of the hill at a sudden unexpected moment and split uh, Custer's men in two. And he lost battlefield control of his own men. The command cohesion <coughs> collapsed at that point. And organized resistance on the part of the whites just, just came to an end when Crazy Horse had split them in this manner. And this is something that shows up even in the archaeological record. You can actually pinpoint the places where people stopped behaving like soldiers and began behaving like men who are in the grip of a panic. So they were angry at Crazy Horse having done that. And it, part of the humiliation of it was that, that George Armstrong Custer was actually a brilliant cavalry tactician and uh, had a glorious record in the Civil War and was really good at exactly the kind of encounter they were engaged in. But Crazy Horse was good at it too. He had a gift, like an athlete's gift, for knowing where to be on a battlefield and when to strike and where an enemy was weak and how to, how to do it. So that was, that was the reason they wanted to kill him. And why did Crazy Horse let them do it? Now when I say he let them do it, what I mean is this. This is a man whose whole life has been devoted to war and to fighting and who was completely um, realistic about what was involved and could, would know uh, under any normal circumstances when he was in danger and when he wasn't and when he could trust people and when he couldn't. And yet, in the final days of his life, despite endless clear warnings uh, from the behavior of the whites that they intended him ill and that they were going to place him under arrest or kill him, uh, and he was receiving reports at all times from various Indians who knew what was happening and, and told him, I mean, he knew when they were planning to kill him. He knew when the army actually handed out the rifles to the Indians who were to do the job. Uh, he knew all that and his reports came to him in camp. Despite all that, he didn't try to flee to the north. He didn't try and take all of his people with him who would have gone in a shot. And he, he accepted their appeals to come back and talk and he trusted them when they led him to the guardhouse. And it was only at the last minute when he actually saw the iron bars in the window in the guardhouse door that he tried to, to break free. He let them do it up until that moment. And the reason, the only reason I can think of that he did that was because he had promised he would not fight anymore. And he just took that promise seriously. That was, that was my belief. It's all a long time ago now. Um, I met a couple of people who knew people who had known Crazy Horse. And it was always a kind of an eerie thing to, to meet somebody who knew somebody who knew Crazy Horse. One of them was a woman named Mabel Kadlicek, who was in a uh, uh, retirement residence uh, in Shadron, Nebraska. And she had known 30 years earlier, 40 years earlier, Thomas American Horse, uh, who was the son of a famous chief of the time and uh, who knew Crazy Horse. He was a kid, but he knew, he knew Crazy Horse. And another one was another woman named Jan Miller, who lived in in uh, San Diego. Uh, she had been married to a guy named David Humphreys Miller who spent a lot of the 1930s drawing pictures of the Indians who had taken part in the Battle of the Little Bighorn, the survivors. And he, he drew 72 portraits of these various Indians. And one of them was a guy named Dewey Beard, a very extraordinary man. 
And Jan Miller uh, knew Dewey Beard well, and when she and David were married, Dewey Beard and his wife Alice were there at the wedding. And Dewey Beard had been at the Little Bighorn, and he knew Crazy Horse. So when you shook hands with Jan Miller, you were almost <laughs> meeting the chief. And at Fort Robinson, where I went a number of times, uh, there's six officers' quarters still alive, uh, still standing, where that were in active use uh, in 1877. And in the one on the western end of the line was the quarters of Lieutenant William Philo Clark. And William Philo Clark was the man who was in charge of trying to deal with Crazy Horse that summer. And uh, he um, thought that he knew how to work Indians. He thought he could manipulate Indians and get them to do what he wanted. And uh, he knew Crazy Horse well, and Crazy Horse would come to see him in his quarters and uh, with some of his friends, and they would all gather into the, the big room there in his quarters and uh, to talk about whatever the issue of the moment was. And Lieutenant William Philo Clark would sit on a chair. He would sit on the back of the chair with his feet on the seat. And there was one other chair in the room, and Crazy Horse sat in the other chair. And the rest of the Indians all sat on the ground in that room. And uh, you can stay at Fort Robinson, and you can rent that cabin to stay in. And you can sleep in the room where Crazy Horse uh, was, which I did on several occasions. And I went hoping that he would appear to me in my dreams, and he did. But he did not make himself clear on every point. <laughs> but his presence, his presence was very much there. I found in, in spending a lot of time thinking about this one man's life that I developed um, a very deep regard for the, the character and uh, probity and actual wisdom of this man. Never beaten in battle, never beaten in battle. But uh, at an early stage, recognized that fighting the whites was pointless. And uh, despite much preferring to live a traditional life as far away from whites as he could get, he knew that he had to bow to reality. And he, he acted on that, which is what leaders sometimes are required to do, painful, painful as it is. So I learned a, a deep respect for him. And I would now like to invite any of you that might have questions to ask him, and I'll, I'll try and answer them. Sure. Um, you had mentioned that the vengeance was to get over the uh, humiliation of uh, Little Bighorn, but could Crump have had a, his own personal motive here since he just had his clock cleaned uh, a couple of months before him by the Sioux? I, I do believe that that also played a role, um, and probably probably a, sig a significant role. Crook, Crook um, was not a uni uniformly hostile to Indians by any means. And uh, he was perfectly capable of understanding that, that whites were the cause of most of the trouble and that it was white avarice that was the behind almost everything. But he, he did not like resistance. And he, he, resist, he intensely resented any kind of sullen, impudent, high-handed, or, or just resistant behavior, which is Crazy Horse you know, very often did. I mean, he said no. He was a guy who could say no. And that was one of the things that drove the army crazy, because he would just say no. They would say, we want to go to Washington and talk to the president. No. I mean, it, that played a big role. So, and Crook had been very roughly handled at the Rosebud. And uh, he had fled another battlefield very at the end of a day of, of fighting with Crazy Horse's people. So he had plenty, of, plenty to resent. And uh, in the army at that time, his own men were making jokes about him. And they were, calling him Rosebud George. And they had uh, written some songs about Crook's failings as an Indian fighter that he bitterly resented. Yeah? Um, in addition to the kind of nobility of him wanting to keep his promise um, at the end of his life of not fighting, could you tell if there were any other physical or mental um, issues um, independent or related to his mother? 
Um, and also, kind of what, to, to any degree, he was embodying his name. Or, oh. how, his, or how his name um, emerged. Uh, his name was given to him by his father. I'll start with the last question. And uh, it means, it's sometimes translated, his crazy horse, as in man afraid of his horses. His crazy horse. And it meant that his horse was crazy, not him. He had a horse. But it was crazy in a special way, Witko. And Witko is a Lakota word that means kind of in a, in a swoon, in a, in a, uh, under the under the influence of a vision uh, in an exalted spiritual state. It's crazy in the sense of being set half disconnected from the world. So a good translation of the name would be, his horse is a powerful horse that is in touch with the powers of the universe. And crazy, a bit go. Um, now the emotional uh, connection to the suicide of his mother Got to be tough. Uh, four years old. Got to be a hard age to lose your mother. Um, but I cannot pinpoint things later in his life that seem to be directly connected to that. And there's no verbal testimony that, that I can think of. At the last, in the last months of his life, and in the last days, but the last months in particular, um, he seems to have suffered a deep indecision that was about how to behave and how to conduct himself and what to do as a leader and also personally. And it was, I would say, it's kind of connected to uh, depression. And he became almost listless at times. This is not anything that anybody was saying at the time, but if you, if you read closely and just pay attention, it's got that, that quality to it. And uh, exactly what role that played, uh, I don't know. But his friends, his friends took note of it. And uh, there's a, on the last day, there's this, he's so unready to fight. This is a fighter, but he's so unready to fight. He just, he, he won't do it. He won't do it until that last minute. And that last minute is something powerful. It's just, you can hardly believe that. The, the rising up in this guy. It was just, it was, he's surrounded by a thousand people. And he tried to fight his way free. It's, it's, it's crazy beyond belief. But uh, at the same time, it was just that indecision ended at that moment. And th that fighting spirit was really there. Yeah. I, I read that he didn't want to be photographed. And I wondered why that was, if you had an opinion on whether or not he was ever photographed. On the web, it shows something which is alleged to be an likeness of him. And um, among other things, he looks seriously cross-eyed. And I'm wondering hmm. if anybody is recording that as a detail about him. No. Uh, no reports of a cross-eyed crazy horse. But, um, and in my opinion, no photograph of crazy horse is known to exist. But there are some candidates. And uh, there's one in particular owned by a guy named Putt Thompson who lives in, uh, on the Crow Reservation and has a, a trading post near the battlefield. Uh, it's a tintype. And it's got a provenance that's, it's got a story. Uh, but it's just all wrong. And uh, there have been lots of other photographs over the years. And typically, when somebody comes up with a crazy horse photograph, uh, the people who are interested in these things, uh, a small but intense fraternity, I assure you, they shoot it down in a minute. And what they, the way they do it is they say, no, that's Jumping Bear or whoever it happens to be. you know. And, then, and they'll cite your chapter and verse, and they'll pull some pictures out of the Library of Congress and the Denver Public Library. And by God, it is Jumping Bear. You know, it's just clear. It happens, it happens over and over again. I do not think he, there was only a four-month period in his life when he could have been photographed, when he was living on the Red Cloud Agency near Fort Robinson. And there's a fellow named Ephraim Dixon, who's a passionate uh, student of frontier photographers. And he has established there were at least two and maybe three photographers with cameras who passed through the Red Cloud Agency that summer. So it could have happened. It's not impossible. But the picture just isn't there. It just isn't there. Do we know? Was that his desire not to be photographed? 
Well, there are several people who claim to have wanted to take his picture. Valentine McGillicuddy said, oh, let me take a picture. Uh, whether he, McGillicuddy even owned a camera, I do not know. But, um, and Crazy Horse, according to McGillicuddy, told him, no, why do you want to steal my soul from me? Uh, but, you know, everybody else got photographed all the time. And uh, there was no big, deep uh, cultural bias against photography on the part of the Sioux in general. It just, evidently, he didn't want to have his picture taken. Yeah? Hmm. He just didn't like Florida, you think? I don't think he would have known that. I don't think there was any way he could know that. Uh, and it, I mean, there, there were army officers who did know, but there, at no sign that, that anybody told him that. It's a, the the. The eyewitnesses who were there, there is more than one. I mean, there's a bunch. It's clear that that, that moment, they're approaching the guardhouse. The door is open. They step up onto the little porch in front of it. They enter the door into the uh, office of the guard's room. It's right next to the guardhouse. They hear something inside the room. It's actually, they actually hear chains. There are prisoners in there. And they, he hears the chains. And the others do. And they begin to say, wait, what's going on? Don't go in there. And then he sees the bars on the, on the window of the guardhouse door, the part that goes into the prison cell on the inside. And at that moment, he pulls back. It's not like, you're going to Florida. It's, it's seeing that. It's the, the lie. It's the, he'd been trusting them up until till that moment. And uh, I think that's what, what, what sent him. Yeah? Was there anything in the oral record or in, in the records from the eyewitnesses or in the people you talk to in terms of oral history about uh, conjecture, other conjectures about why he, so to speak, let himself be taken? Could, could you repeat Yeah, the, uh, the question is, is there any other explanation kind of afloat anywhere the, uh, about why he was ready to allow himself to be taken into custody? And uh, I would say not. It's, it, uh, it's it's, it's the behavior. He, he's, he shows plenty of sign of having a sickening feeling of dread. This is not going right. Things are not unfolding in a good way. This is going to end in trouble. But at each stage where he's just on the point of maybe resisting, seriously resisting, you know, some army officer would persuade him, no, you know, well, I'm, We've got promises. There's nothing will be done. You, you have to go and speak to Colonel Bradley. If you, if you settle things with Colonel Bradley, if Spotted Tail agrees, you can bring your people to come and live at his agency. There won't be any more trouble at Red Cloud. He's reassured, and each time he does it, in the morning of the day that, of his last day, I mean, there are three or four times where he shows, just shows the deepest reluctance to go forward. He said he would go forward, but he doesn't want to. And first he says, yeah, I, I, I forgot my saddle. He had to go home and have to get a saddle. Well, he goes home, he gets a saddle, he comes back. And, and then uh, he doesn't want to go when Lieutenant Lee is leaving. They're driving in an ambulance. And Lee wants him to ride in the ambulance. No, I have to go on my horse. And, and, but then he does what Lee wants. And, and uh, eventually he rides 43 miles from, from the Spotted Tail Agency to the Camp Robinson. It's an extraordinary thing, an extraordinary event. You can, you can visualize it. Uh, they start off a very small group, and uh, Lee had made private arrangements with other friendly to him Indians for people to join them along the way. And after 15 <coughs> or 20 minutes, a couple of people showed up, and a couple of hours later, a few more. And by the time they actually reached Fort Robinson, there's a, a hundred or more people with Lee, and they're all almost all hostile to Crazy Horse. So he's seeing every step along the way. This is, this is not going right. It's not going to end well. Yeah? What happened after they killed him? Well, um, nothing. And uh, it took a lot of doing to ensure that nothing would happen. Um, 
It was a very intense morning, and uh, classic Sioux grieving is a four-day process, and it involves a lot of mutilation uh, of people who are close to him. Sometimes they'll slash their arms or their legs with knives. And uh, his parents, his father and his stepmother, took possession of his body the next morning. And uh, they prepared it in the traditional way and uh, brought him on a travel way back the way he had come the day before to the Spotted Tail Agency 40 miles, 40 miles away. <coughs> and for, during that four-day period, uh, the army was very tense, very worried they would be fighting. Uh, it was kind of a miracle that it didn't happen at the minute that he was stabbed, but it didn't. And uh, partly because the crowd was so intense around him that a lot of the people just didn't know what had happened. They couldn't tell. They couldn't see. They were all on a level on a flat parade ground in front of the, front of the guardhouse, and they couldn't really see what was going on. And so the violence was avoided then, and it was avoided, avoided throughout. Um, all of this was done basically to keep the Indians from leaving the reservation and in particular rejoining or joining Sitting Bull in, in Canada. So as soon as Crazy Horse was dead, a decision was carried out to remove all of the Oglala people from northwest Nebraska where they were to the Missouri River where they did not want to go, not one bit. And uh, they started in the middle of October. They immediately ran into snowstorms. It was a grueling ordeal. It's never been much written about, but it was one of the one of the great ordeals of Indians, you know, being forced from one spot to another uh, for reasons that are hard to understand. And and a couple of days out, uh, all of Crazy Horses and Oglala people just took off and went to Canada. A thousand or more just took off. I mean, the one thing they were trying to avoid and that they feared the most, they brought about, and uh, nothing much happened there either. They just went and spent four very lean years in, in Canada and eventually came back. Did that have any repercussions among the Sioux? I mean, was there tension between them? There was a lot of tension, and there still is today. You can get into a, quite a quarrel mm -hmm. in uh, Pine Ridge if you uh, get Crazy Horse people and Red Cloud people together. Uh, and, and discussing those events. It's still, these are live traditions there, and uh, the questions are, remain painful and immediate. Uh, so, and that has been the case ever since. There was a, a profound psychic trauma that took place that, uh, from which they've never really fully recovered, just like we've never really fully recovered from the killing of John F. Kennedy or Lincoln. You just don't get over it. It's just so shocking, and it's such a violation of who you are, um, and that's 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 still a, a living thing. How old was he? Uh, he was been about about thirty eight, depending on when you think he was born. Um, and there, eighteen forty is a good a good guess, but so is eighteen thirty eight. Uh, his friend He Dog one time said that Crazy Horse and I were born in the same year and in the same season of the same year, and. Uh, he said that to a couple of different people on a couple of occasions. And, and, uh, and then on both occasions, which were a number of years apart, he said how old he was then, so that the person he was talking to could just do the math. And, and one time he said he was 95, and another time he said he was 92, and it's either 1838 or 1840. Uh, yes, yes, and and no. It was they they didn't run into any violence or, or military resistance of any kind or anything like that. But uh, there was no nothing was provided for them. The Canadian authorities did not feed them or give them a special place to live or intercede on their behalf in any way. And eventually, they it was life was too tough there. I mean, the buffalo were on the way out there very soon, just as they were in the in the in the northern plains of the United States. I mean, when Crazy Horse surrendered in 1877, there were still lots of buffalo in the, in the Tongue and Powder River country uh, south of the Yellowstone. But within about three years, that whole northern herd was killed. I mean, it just happened like that. It was un unbelievably quick. You. Thank you. 
Mm-hmm. You're welcome. The national reaction to the killing of Crazy Horse. I wish I could tell you that there was a deep spirited protest at the injustice of killing this man needlessly. But there was nothing of the kind. And, uh, you know, I, I, I thought people knew about it everywhere, almost immediately. The New York Times had stories about it. It was printed in London. It was printed in Berlin. I mean, the news was out. I thought I was going to find somewhere. Somebody was going to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why exactly did that happen? All the people on the, at the fort where it happened began recording their versions at a very early date, sometimes immediately. Um, but I never found any word of protest anywhere. And there were lots of people who were in the business of being friends of Indians at that time. Nothing. Yeah. He had one child, a girl, whose name was, they are afraid of her. And uh, she died at the age of about three. And that was the only child that he ever had. Um, but there are a lot of people in the Pine Ridge area who claim to be descendants of Crazy Horse. And uh, it's, not a, it's not a, it's a, it's a hard claim properly to weigh because um, they have a very different notion of kinship system than we do. And uh, I mean, everybody of a certain generation would be brothers and sisters. And everybody of another generation would be grandmothers and grandfathers. And you could call your mother mother, or you could call somebody else of her age mother. Uh, same with aunts and uncles. And so they all called each other cousin. And sometimes they really were cousins, and sometimes they weren't. But they called each other cousins. And they called each other brothers and sisters, even when they weren't. And uh, there, are no, there, there are no descendants of Crazy Horse that I know of. And uh, I don't think there are any serious claimants. But there are family members who take a proprietary interest in his, his reputation and his name. Let me go over there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the typical education of a, of a Oglala warrior or war leader at, at that time uh, would have involved going out at a very early age with war parties and uh, uh, to hold horses, to haul water, to build fires. I mean, he might, might be 10 years old or 11 years old. And these were dangerous occasions where, you know, a young man was, was tested. Uh, for coolness and, and the rest. And uh, the great difference between Indian approaches to warfare and white approaches at that time really had to do with personal engagement with the enemy. Indians ran right up to the guy, you know, and uh, sometimes they just touched him and then ran away again. But, other times, I mean, there would be a personal encounter, and, and you know, death and mayhem would result. Whites liked to keep as far away as they possibly could. It wasn't that the Indians were reckless; it's that they, once they were committed to battle, it was very intense. They just dove straight into it. Um, most of the warfare they engaged in was on a s small scale. That's it was small unit actions, a handful of people, typically. Uh, sometimes a lot of people would show up at the same place at the same time and there would be a, a big fight, a big killing, but that was not typically the way it was. And, and they, didn't, they didn't maneuver in the way that uh, white Anglo armies tended to maneuver. One of the extraordinary things was that Crazy Horse could make that transition, that he, that he could actually suddenly start operating on a big scale where you had 500 people or 1,000 people that were uh, following your lead. And, and, and doing what you want. It was, it was all on-the-job training. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Rick, can we have just one more question? I know some of you need to go, so if I have one okay. more question. Mr. Uh, uh, Powers has agreed to stay afterward, and uh, we do have copies of his book back there, and I'm sure he'd be glad to sign it. I would. Have one more question, and then we'll wrap it up for the evening. Okay. Oh, no, I was just going to say a wonderful book. And, um, Thank you. About how he was such a fighter, like he would dismount and shoot. Well, he, he was uh, clear-headed about this. His friend He-Dog said that uh, 
uh, Crazy Horse was not a person who uh, treated war lightly, and he went in it to win, and uh, typically he did win. Um, and one of the examples he gave, and others did too, was that uh, even in the heat of battle, Crazy Horse would uh, um, get off his horse, get down on the ground in order to aim and take a careful shot in the hope of, hope of getting somebody. And um, there are a couple of occasions where whites think they saw a crazy horse in battle. Uh, and typically it was journalists who thought so. <laughs> and it happened once after, after a fight at Slim Buttes. And there, um, Captain Charles King uh, thought he saw a crazy horse because uh, he was riding around on a white horse. And Crazy Horse did have a favorite war horse that was white. And he described this guy getting off in the middle of the fight and taking some shots at the soldiers. And I've often wondered if maybe Captain Charles King wasn't the only guy who actually really saw him and, and, and recognized him. Well, Mr. Powers, thank you very much for coming. Thank you.